And we're back with more of This Week in Science. Yes, we are, and we are joined by our guest this evening, Dr. Amro Hamdoun. He is an associate professor of biology at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, University of California, San Diego. He has a PhD in physiology from UC Davis. <laughs> We were there at the same time. That was fun. Um, he also held a, an NIH NRSA postdoctoral fellowship at Hopkins Marine Station of Stanford University. His general interests are in the fields of developmental biology and environmental toxicology. His current research focuses on the defense and survival mechanisms of embryos and the biology of the accumulation and elimination of chemicals in marine animal cells. And the sea urchin is usually your animal of choice, but um, in a recent paper that was published, your lab found that uh, persistent organic pollutants in the ocean accumulate in the tissues of tuna, inhibiting cellular defenses of cells in humans and mice by binding with essential transport protein proteins. Fun stuff. Amro, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. And, and Amro, that last bit was terrifying to me. Um, yeah. Because I am a uh, four to five can of tuna a week. Because uh, it is my time. If, if you took everything on the grocery list and looked at the thing that I, I consistently buy and consume the most, yeah. it's tuna. Me too. Oh, so, oh no. So, that, so we're doomed. So we're doomed. That's the... <laughs> This is sort of a good news, bad news story. So the um, bad news is that there are really contaminated fish out there in the ocean, and they account for about 3% of the fish that we caught that you probably don't want to eat. The bad news is there's no way to know when you buy your fish at the store which one's really contaminated or not because we don't have a really great mechanism of labeling fish from the point of capture all the way through to the supermarket where you buy the fish. Mm. So I wish I could tell you which can of tuna to buy, yeah. but um, you're sort of on your own. Well, I'm, it wouldn't <laughs> stop me. This is the thing, like it'd be great to like narrow down the right can, like hold it up to the light and like no, yeah. that one's not quite right. But right, three uh, percent, I'll take those odds. That's right. Well, um, we know where some of the most contaminated places on the planet are, so. Um, that's one way we can kind of reduce those fish in the food supply. And um, we also know what the contaminants are, so we can look for them. So there, there, are, there are ways to do that, and one of the things we're working on now is ways to look at these contaminants more cheaply and rapidly so that um, anybody could do just what you're talking about, hold the tuna can up to the light and determine whether um, the tuna that's in there is, is uh, uh, clean or not. And uh, an important thing to add to all of this is that these contaminants are not unique to fish or seafood or tuna. They're really everywhere. But um, fish, we focused on fish because fish tend to have the highest levels of these chemicals as compared to some of the other foods that we consume regularly. Yeah, because fish, as they swim in the ocean, they, they breathe, they eat, they are surrounded by, all, they're, they're in a bath of anything that's around them whereas other animals have to go searching in for specific food types, and it's, it's a little bit different. And top of the food chain there with a the tuna, right. too. That's so what I was going to say, yeah, like with mercury, that's the big concern with mercury, right? Yeah, bioaccumulation is huge. Yeah, so the, the, idea, the, the idea is that um, not only are they swimming around in the ocean, the ocean's large, but um, the ocean... Has, has been used sort of as a dumping ground for a lot of these environmental chemicals. And of course, all of our land sources of chemicals like agriculture drain into rivers and they ultimately end up in the ocean. So we looked at um, fish in the Gulf of Mexico, for example, and those fish have very high levels of these chemicals because the Mississippi River is a great carrier of contaminants that would normally be on land and end up in the ocean. Can we talk about the contaminants themselves for a minute? So I, I mentioned briefly that they're persistent organic pollutants, but what does that mean to the layperson? Or and to me? <laughs> and to Justin. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, actually, the reason I came on the show is I was hoping you guys could explain my paper to me. But if I <laughs> knew it, then. Um, 
so I think you know they basically they're chemicals that hang around, and unlike you know a lot of things that are in the environment break down, and after uh, a few days or weeks or months are essentially gone. Persistent pollutants are this class of chemicals. They include really famous things like DDT um, that um, really arguably spark the modern environmental movement. Rachel Carson's work mm -hmm. on uh, on on pollution. Um, the, the idea is that these are chemicals that don't break down and they have this really unusual tendency to move out of the environment and into living things and as a result um, because we eat other animals they end up in us and humans um, all of the chemicals we looked at in our study are things that you can find in the blood or in a human body uh, of, of every American or probably every person on the planet. So whether um, whether or not you know you think you're you, you can try to avoid these chemicals, but they're really persistent. They really stick around and they just sort of end up in you. Yeah, there are things which like are, flame retardants, which are or mm. the chemicals that are put in uh, the the foams that make up couches. Um, or That's they're right. delicious. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. and well, I, I know I know of people who are working very hard to get flame retardant uh, furniture uh, outlawed, and to get these flame retardants taken out of our furnishings so that we won't have them in our home environments anymore. But they're still going to stick around. Mm -hmm. So the state of California just passed a law that requires labeling of flame retardants on uh, labeling of furniture that contains flame retardants. And actually, the person that's probably done the most work on this, um, or one of the people who's done a lot of work on this, is Arlene Blum, who yep. wrote the book Annapurna, and she is actually a chemist from UC Berkeley, and pointed out that. Um, a lot of these flame retardants, the structures of these flame retardants, um, when you ban one of them, what happens is that people make another structure that's very similar and use it, and they get the sort of same outcome. So um, she pushed hard so that we could have kind of um, at least um, labeling and the ability to know what it is that's in our in our furniture or in our in our house. Our major exposure to some of these retardants is just household dust. Just dust. That's Just household dust. So you're going to be picking great. up a lot of flame retardants from those um, stain repellents from your carpets. How many chemicals did you uh, did you look for in your particular assay? We looked for 40 chemicals that are um, three major classes: um, pesticides, flame retardants, and um, PCBs. These are um, legacy. Um, uh, uh, electronics chemicals, and then there's uh, we also looked at some plastics related compounds like uh, uh, phthalates and bisphenol A. Yeah. Okay. So what do they actually do? They they attach to this transporter, and how did you? What's the story be behind how you figured this particular inhibition of the transporter out? Like how did you how did you determine all this? So we were we were trying to understand why it is that certain chemicals are so persistent, and and the idea being that if you can figure that out, you can make chemicals that don't persist. So um, that would sort of be the that'd be sort of an amazing thing to do. You can make a flame retardant that keeps your laptop from bursting into flames, right? That's that's a good thing. Um, but then it but breaks the down same, over time. But then yeah. it breaks down and it doesn't end up in you and it doesn't have any problems. And what we thought was we would find some chemicals that this transporter, which is a really important cell defense, would latch onto and eliminate, get rid of, and that would give us some clues into which ones are safer and which ones are worse. And we looked at these persistent chemicals because they're precisely the kind of thing we worry about in terms of environmental chemicals. And the unexpected thing for us was that rather, they, so, so they latch on and what we show in the paper is they actually bind right where they should if they were going to be um, expelled or eliminated by these transporters, but instead of being eliminated, they sort of hold on and they prevent the transporter from actually doing its work and they actually slow it down. So the, the consequence is that the more of these things you get exposed to, the, the less effective your body is going to be at getting rid of chemicals you would otherwise get rid of. So do you have uh, it, you you do you have evidence or are people looking for evidence of it actually 
influencing immune function and having downstream effects? Or is this just the first study showing, okay, we know that it blocks the activity of these transporters, slows them down, they don't work as well, and now there are chemicals getting into cells. We don't know yeah. what happens next. Yeah, so the idea that this could happen is um, was proposed about 20 years ago by a Croatian scientist named Branko Kurilek, and he suggested that maybe what makes these chemicals so persistent is rather than being pumped out or eliminated by the system, they actually slow it down or bog it down. Um, and it's been shown in a variety of different organisms and cell lines and different test scenarios that this actually occurs, but nobody really had a sense for how this occurs. Does it occur through some kind of predictable binding to the drug transporter, or is this just some general effect of weakening a cell and making it not work? What our, sh our paper shows is that this occurs through a very specific binding to residues in the transporter that are evolutionarily conserved. So 15 of the residues that bind PBDE, which is a flame retardant in a human, are, are, are the same 15 are also present in the same transporter from a tuna. And what this means is that if you um, want to begin to design chemicals to be recognized and eliminated, you actually have some targets that you can work uh, with. And um, we think, you know, in terms of human health impacts, we don't know. You, you raise a good point. We don't know who is going to be affected most by this. But our concern is obviously about vulnerable populations. Yeah. There's there's one in particular um, that we um, we thought about, and that is human neonates. So normally this protein, P glycoprotein, sitting around in your gut, and it's keeping nasty things that are in your diet um, from entering into your body. Um, human neonates in the first six months of life tend to have relatively low levels of these protective proteins in their guts. So they're already kind of at the threshold. And um, breast milk tends to concentrate a lot of these pollutants. In fact, in villages in, in Africa where DDT is still used for um, malaria control, the concentrations of DDT in breast milk are, are as high as 30 micromolar. And that's well within the kind of range of concentrations that we saw um, causing problems for this defense system in a test tube. So we think this um, we think this paper should encourage our policymakers to think a little bit about this pathway as being a kind of um, potential way in which chemicals can cause harm um, and maybe think about what are safe. We don't have exposure limits for these sorts of things. Think about what our safe exposure limits should be. Um, and uh, and you know we we one analogy might be to think of these as being a bit like endocrine disruptors, right? We have mm -hmm. chemicals that we think of as being like hormone mimics. These are immune system weakening chemicals that we might want to think about um, how much of them we want to eat, how much we want in our food, how many cans of tuna Justin should eat <laughs> per week. How much tuna? But it's not maybe as an adult you don't think about it as much. How much? How much should you feed your children tuna? Or how much, you know, if you're pregnant, how much tuna? We tell we tell pregnant women not to eat tuna because of the mercury, like Blair said earlier. earlier. But maybe there are other reasons. Just that's, add it to the list. <laughs> that's right. Most people think of mercury as being the major contaminant to worry about in tuna, and it certainly is. It can be at very high levels in um, very high trophic level tuna. Mm -hmm. We looked at yellowfin tuna, which are somewhere in the middle. Um, as compared to, say, bluefin or um, skipjack, which is what's in a lot of canned tuna. And um, even even there, we, we found um, quite a bit of these persistent pollutants in certain fish. Um, but again, the good news is you can avoid this if you know where your fish comes from and you know that it's a place where there are relatively little uh, uh, human activity. I, I, I live in Portland, Oregon now, and that sounds like the kind of farm-to-table activity that we joke about on shows like Portlandia. You know? Yeah. I now know the name of my tuna because I went to yeah. the tuna. I went to the tuna yeah. farm. Well, right. And it seems like this test too that we could apply to the can uh, could be applied when they when they're selling this tuna to market. You know, they could yeah. they could apply this then and say, okay, if you want to buy one with the level of contaminants, then you can't label it like contaminant free. You have to go to that. Send it to a black label tuna canning uh, situation. I'm I'm kind of thinking uh, I should just go 
to my own doctor and have him run a couple of tests and just see. Yes. How full of contaminants are you? Yeah, how <laughs> I'll many be sure of not those to eat any Justin then. Do I have? Because it looks like the doctor turns to me is like, Justin, you need to stop eating couches, then I know. I've been doing yeah. Yeah. So, so that's kind of my question too is we're talking about these contaminants and it sounds pretty scary but mm -hmm. there's lots of things that we talk about that's in our food or in the air or in our water that are also scary yeah. where is my freak out level on this am I at like a 6 am I at an 8 am I at a 3 <laughs> how bad yeah. is this yeah I don't think it helps to freak out ever so I, <laughs> I'd, I'd encourage a 0 freak out okay. level okay, good. on this um, I think you know. I think there are other types of food that also have these contaminants. For the average American, the primary route of exposure is through meat and dairy. The reason simply being that we eat a lot more meat and dairy that we than we eat fish. Yeah. Um, so not eating fish is not necessarily a solution. If you eat, um, you will be exposed to these contaminants. Mm -hmm. And you know, you don't really get a choice. I mean, environmental chemistry is this interesting. Um, experiment because there is no control population on the planet. We all have these chemicals in our body and we don't know exactly what the effects are going to be. But I think there is an important lesson there in that before we make compounds and put them into the environment, we might want to look at some of the factors that influence their bioaccumulation and really avoid making chemicals that are going to enhance bioaccumulation or reduce our ability to eliminate other types of chemicals that we we would normally keep out. And and do we have any good contenders for for a non-persistent chemical that could do some replacements? Well, we showed in our study that simply changing the um, stereochemistry of a molecule can dramatically change its interaction with a drug transporter. So we looked at two chemicals, dieldrin and endrin, which are stereoisomers of one another, and um, we found that one of them acts as this very strongly inhibitory molecule, um, and the other is 20 times less potent. So I think even looking at very simple solutions like what stereoisomer of the compound you use um, will help. The other lesson, and I think it's one that isn't really new in environmental chemistry, but um, we see it again and again, is that when we, we when you take a, an organic molecule and you remove all the hydrogen atoms and you replace them with halogens, you really reduce the ability of metabolic enzymes to break it down. And, and of course, you know the reason why is that um, carbon-halogen bonds are some of the most stable bonds in nature. In fact, the most stable bond in nature is the carbon-fluorine bond. So nonstick chemicals are, are chemicals, for example, where all of the hydrogens have been replaced with fluorine atoms. Fluorine. And that makes an incredibly slippery, wonderful molecule that doesn't stick your egg, but also makes one that's very difficult to break down in the yeah, environment. Yeah, so, so it'll, be, it'll, be, it'll be there much longer, but it won't be in our, our biology. Which, yeah, yeah. Which is an interesting trade-off, but I guess yeah. that if that's, the, you know, if we're not worried about the fact that it actually exists and are worried about it being taken up in, mm -hmm. in organisms, I, I, I would think that's an excellent solution. Huh. Well, and there are nonstick alternatives that don't require the use of, um, based on the way a material is shaped or organized, that reduce how sticky something is that don't require the use of these chemicals. So the question might be, you know, do we really need these things? Um, in all of the applications that we use them in. Is it really essential to have um, stain repellent carpets or can we replace some of those carpets with other materials that might not require the use of, that are still pretty stain repellent, might not require the use of these um, mm -hmm. compounds? I'm, I'm yeah, I kind of think about um, the, when antibacterial came in onto the market and we started putting it in everything. Uh -huh. antibacter antibacterial hand soap, antibacterial sponges, antibacterial everything. No bacteria. <laughs> never. Antibacterial ever. comb. That was right. the weirdest one. Like, yeah, and then all really... of a sudden we were like, oh, maybe we don't need antibacterial in everything. Yeah, and that's maybe right. it's actually a bad idea. Yeah, it's counterproductive. <laughs> Yeah, that's absolutely right. And um, bacteria are um, bacteria. The the emerging kind of literature on bacteria says that they're pretty um, good for you if you have the right ones. And so we were constantly messing with them and creating more harm than good. And I think there, are, I think we sort of repeat this lesson over and over again. <laughs> with 
environmental chemistry. We make something, we use it before we fully understand what mm -hmm. the consequences will be, and then we sort of uh, try to catch up with it and, and change it. And I, um, the, 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 our goal is that um, environmental chemistry become a more predictive rather than reactive science. What a good idea. <laughs> So how does it feel to you? I mean, you've been—I know you've been working on uh, the uh, the environmental chemistry angle and developmental biology angle for uh, for years, and now it seems. Are you, how do you feel about starting to push this into also the socio political socio political side of things to try and actually take your research and say, okay, we now need to start making some recommendations. Oh, well, that's what the FDA and EPA do, and um, what we can do as scientists is really give them the best information available. Um, one of the things we didn't know, as I mentioned before this study, is whether this transporter inhibition phenomenon occurs through some kind of predictable binding. Mm -hmm. um, so knowing that, they can now begin to look at this and, and um, ask questions about how much of these chemicals uh, we should be exposed to in our diet. But there are people who do that and do it very well, and that's, that's, their, um, that's their job. So I, I, think, I think giving them the information is probably our role. Awesome. And what's your next step? Are you, uh, are you going further with analyses of this sort? Yeah, so we're now working with um, people in the Department of Pediatrics here at UCSD to get a handle on when um, in early life an animal might be or a human might be very um, sensitive to these classes of compounds. We know that things like drug transporters, you know, in an early embryo stage are not always on. There are periods when they turn on or off. And so when they might be especially low, might be windows when an exposure to a small amount of these transporter inhibiting compounds would be problematic. So we're trying to track those developmental windows down. Um, and then we're also looking at other defense proteins. We're trying to take the same model that we applied here for looking at how um, one chemical effect or one transporter is affected and look at the other transporters um, and other parts of the chemical um, defense system. People often use call this the chemical immunity system or the chemical defense system and see how, um, how they might respond to these same kinds of exposures. Yeah, it's an interesting way to put it. I mean, uh, in articles that it talked about, oh, this affects your immune system. And so the way that we normally think of the immune system um, as the, the T cells and the in, in the blood and beta B cells and everything, it's this is different. This is like this is like skin. This is like a barrier. This is a door. And I think it, like there's you you're quoted in several articles as calling it a cellular bouncer, which <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is that's it's right. just. An, yeah, it's just an interesting, an, another interesting level of, okay, we have a barrier against the environment, and we That's have to, right. our body has to choose what it's going to get to bring in or not, and sometimes it can't. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that we, we now appreciate about how cells work is that in addition to having a system that protects us against pathogens, things like viruses and bacteria, we also have a very elaborate system in the body to protect us against foreign chemicals. And the reason for that is that um, you know plants and animals and um, uh, uh, have always, and bacteria have always been making um, molecules to defend themselves to prevent other things from eating them, um, and and uh, in in response, their their um, predators have been making um, strategies or proteins, evolving strategies or proteins to overcome those toxins. So um, we actually have a very elaborate system to protect ourselves from chemicals, and it's pretty effective against the classes of chemicals that it evolved to protect us against. Where it falls apart is against things that we never see in nature, like things that are highly halogenated. Yeah, we're, crea we're creating an alien environment, in, in essence, one that we didn't evolve uh, to, uh, to uh, deal with. That's right. That's right. Uh, and uh, bringing up the DDT question again, now with uh, mosquitoes making their way into the United States, there is talk from many to bring DDT back into use in more areas of the world, including the United States, for mosquito control. And so this is a um, this is something that if we if we need if we if we 
want to stop these persistent compounds from actually having developmental effects, we need to figure it out one way or another. Yeah, DDT is a very interesting study. Of course, the the you know it's still used in places where um, there is malaria, and um, mm -hmm. malaria is a terrible disease. And so, um, any strategy that can help reduce the human death toll to malaria is certainly um, valuable. That said, um, DDT is not is is not a perfect solution. Insects rapidly evolve resistance to DDT, and uh, as a result, after a few generations of use, it becomes less effective. And there are other strategies, of course, that are necessary. In parts of the world where there's a high DDT burden, there's often also poor sanitation and other issues that need to be addressed before um, before you can really sort of stamp out the, the problem of, you know, vector-borne disease. So um, I, I, I think these, you know, I think DDT may, may be part of an arsenal, but it's certainly not the um, uh, silver bullet that it's sometimes portrayed yeah. to be. Yeah. Oi! Are you going to go sea urchin tasting anytime soon? <laughs> Bring it to something. breeds contempt. <laughs> <laughs> right. A little um, bit too often. I don't, I don't eat my research animals, so that's, a, oh. that's an important rule. It's an important rule of science. Uh -huh. Yeah, Kiki, how do zebra yeah. finches taste? Yeah, never. I, I never had the uh, the skewer roasted zebra finches. That wasn't quite the, <laughs> the direction. It's it like eating a teeny tiny wing or a teeny tiny drumstick. Just... I'm sure some people might enjoy it. <laughs> People eat everything. I don't know. <laughs> oh my goodness, Amro, this is just uh, this is fascinating. It's um, I think the point that the the perspective you're taking on it is a very positive, action-oriented perspective that I hope is the message that's being picked up by people, as opposed to the many headlines that that we see that are the fear mongering, be afraid of your tuna kind of uh, kind of thought, but rather hey, we need to keep working on this, and there is action that can be taken as opposed to being afraid of our food. Yeah, so. that's right. I, I, I think, um, you know, as I, I've been asked about this, and I eat tuna. I think it's a, it's a healthy food, and there's certainly plenty of advantages to eating tuna. But um, I think where we can go with this is to make sure we, we eat the least contaminated ones. Um, and I think people are, are, are going to want to eat less contaminated fish. Oh yeah, that's. I mean, if you if if, if given the option, if I have certain, a choice. Yes. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, but I, I and I'm curious too, and this is a, probably a longer, different conversation about how, because it seems like the profit side of chemistry is about creating the newer, the better, the efficient product, and and is probably more so now, but still uh, less so concerned with the environmental uh, downstream costs of it further further down so so I do hope I do hope uh, the discoveries that you're making get incorporated into uh, the production of new new chemistry that'll facilitate it the brighter better more efficient future um, although I, I, I because I, you know because that is the profit driven segment of all of this I can see that as, as being a challenge uh, I I think green chemicals are profitable, and I think there is a, a demand and market for them. I think um, the chemistry industry recognizes that, and I think it's important also not to think of these industries as single entities. Um, some companies in the chemical industry have taken very bold moves to eliminate chemicals that are found to be persistent. Um, an example of that was the 3M company. Um, choosing to voluntarily kind of phase out perfluorochemicals when they found out they were persistent. And other com companies have not. So um, okay. I think, you know, I think it, it's there's always a danger of painting with a broad brush when we're thinking about these industries and um, how they might react or how much they, they want to do to avoid making persistent chemicals. Some Some are quite proactive about that. Yeah, and I wouldn't. I mean, and and uh, I'm not meaning to uh, think that the profit side of the chemistry industry absolutely doesn't care downstream. But again, and looking at like we've come up with this great new product, let's spend five, ten years testing it in various ways before we release it. That's the part that I find 
is going to be the difficult challenge. But if we have things like this, you know, uh, where you can look and see how it affects this transcriptor, you know, if they have a set of things that they can quickly and actively test the new product on and with, um, that might accelerate that their ability to bring the right. good products. Yep. Uh, to me. Yeah, that's absolutely right, and and I think they're, um, you know, the 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 current laws that govern these sorts of things don't. Um, necessarily require that kind of testing you're talking about. Although um, in Europe, um, a, law, a law was passed several years ago called REACH, and it does require this kind of testing. But the very challenge is exactly what you brought up. What do you actually test That's with, and what do you look for? And um, this could be one of several things you could look for, um, in addition to whether or not you know a uh, a you know an animal dies when you put it in the water with this thing because really we're not you know the, the big change in how toxicology is happening these days is we're no longer really concerned um, with eliminating the incredibly toxic molecules that are going to kill something we're now looking for much more subtle effects of chemicals interfering with hormone systems um, affecting our uh, you know pathogen defenses or chemical defenses and that's going to require a lot more thinking about these kinds of biological pathways that we could test. Mini organoids. That's mini, like, yeah. Mini organoids in dishes, and you, and you test it on them. Maybe that's the future of this testing. We'll see. Amro, do you have any other big plans for your uh, your research future? Any more? Any other uh, studies that you're working on that you're excited about? Um, we're also looking at um, cells called primordial germ cells. These are cells that give rise to eggs and sperm. Yeah. Some Blair will be happy to hear that. And they're specified very early in embryonic development. These um, in most animals are set aside in the first five days of life. And, um, and then they, they basically uh, hang out and wait until the gonad develops and then they migrate to the gonad and they, um, they they begin to divide and then produce in, you know, whether they're male or female eggs or sperm. So uh, one of the things we're looking at now is how these cells protect themselves because if they acquire mutations in early embryonic development, unlike mutations that will happen in any other part of the embryo, mutations in these cells, of course, will be passed on to future generations. So we're, we're very interested in how those cells might defend themselves, whether they use transporters or other pathways to do that, and um, how environmental exposures might affect them. And then, um, yeah, that, I think that's, that, that keeps me more than busy. Yes, it sounds. <laughs> these are these are some some broad directions to go in, and some, there's a lot of research, a lot of experiments. I'm sure you're coming up with. Yeah, yeah. The people in the lab wish I would come up with fewer. <laughs> <laughs> I remember being a grad student and a postdoc once. I was like, oh, yeah, that's enough. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I still. I, yeah, that's right. Once upon a time, many suggestions. All right. I won't keep you any later tonight, unless you would like to stay with us for the end of the show. We've got a few more science stories that we're going to cover on the way out of the show. But um, thank you so much for You're joining welcome. us tonight and talking about your work. I appreciate it. Take care. Bye, Have guys. Have a great night. Bye, Amro.